morning, everyone. Wow, that's a little louder than I thought. Uh, all right, let's get started. Monday morning, 9 a.m. Monday fun day. Monday fun day. I actually never heard that. I don't know if that's actually true. Is it true? Monday fun day. No. Sunday fun day. That, I definitely heard that. It's one of those things you tell yourself as a crime. Mm. Oh, I see. You're placeboing yourself. I got it. Cool. Yes, Monday fun day. Let's get ready to roll. Uh, brief overview of the week today. We're going to go over lambda calculus Wednesday. Um, and after class today, I'm going to release uh, the practice, the midterm three practice, the practice midterm three exam. Then on Wednesday, we'll go over that practice exam in class. Then we'll have the midterm on Friday. Cool. And the homework is due Wednesday as well. I think it's Tuesday. It's tomorrow. Tomorrow. Okay. Great. So we've been talking about lambda calculus, and we've been trying to think. Uh, we've actually been trying to establish. So what? What do we mean when we uh, when we write a lambda calculus expression? Right. So we're kind of trying to treat this as we're learning a new programming language that we don't know. You know. So we're trying to come in with open mind. We don't want to take any preconceived notions. Right. So what's the syntax? <laughs> what are the syntax rules for a lambda calculus expression? Uh, an expression goes to two expressions. To two expressions, so expression space expression. All right, that's one. Let's expression goes to ID. Expression goes to an ID. Expression dot expression. Uh, not quite. It's lambda, lambda, expression. lambda expression dot expression. Lambda ID. ID, yeah. So that's an important thing, right? This can't be an arbitrary uh, just expression, right? It can only be an ID. And we have expression, space expression, and then what's the last one? In parentheses. In parentheses, good. All right, look at that. See, look, not scary, not scary at all. Okay, so we looked through some examples. So we talked about the disambiguation rules, right? So we looked at, we saw that when, whenever we see E space E, we're gonna assume that this is left associative. So this means that in the case of X, Y, Z, we're going to group x and y together first. And in the case of w, x, y, z, we first group w, x together, the leftmost, and then we group w, x, and y together, right? And for here, we're going to try to extend the dot all the way as far to the right as possible. So that lambda id dot expression here is going to be parsed as if the whole expression inside lambda x dot expression is x space y. Uh, similarly here, we're going to have this dot go all the way there. OK, some other examples. So is this the case that, so is this the same as lambda x dot y x? No. no. Why not? Because you would arrive there via a different tree. You would ah, you'd arrive there via a different tree. Right, but so what does the disambiguation rules tell us about this expression on the right? So uh, the right. yx is one expression, but yeah. lambda x is another. Exactly, right? So, um, right, so this, yeah, so here, even though we have the dot, right, so it should be kind of clear, even though, yes, we have the dot, and we said we try to extend it as far right as possible, well, clearly it can't extend farther than this parentheses, right? So we're parsing this. Thing, right? This is saying, okay, the very first thing is expression, space expression, right? Expression here, expression here, because of the parentheses, right? Those are forcing us to parse it in that way. Okay. Uh, lambda x dot parentheses x, y? Yeah, that's the same. So is this is the same as what? The second one. The second one here? Uh, up. This one? Yes. Mm, no, because it's not even Y. Y is not even Y. Oh, it hasn't flipped. Yes. Details. Right? But we can see that this, the body in here, right, is lambda X, and the body is both X and Y of this lambda X. Right? So the dot extends all the way to there. All right. What about this? If you had to insert all the parentheses possible to make this unambiguous, could you do it? How many would you insert? Three. Three 
three sets. Okay, sets, yeah. Three Four sets. sets. Inserting parentheses <laughs> should always be uh, even, right? Unless you're talking about sets. I agree, right? So you have A, B inside here. You have, you're going to fully disambiguate this, right? I mean, you'd add another parentheses around here. You'd add parentheses here, parentheses here. Four sets. That'd be four. Four sets. Four. I didn't hear that. Counting. Okay, so does everybody feel any questions on the syntax part of Lambda Calculus? This is something that is very important because when you write a Lambda expression, right, and if you write it assuming different disambiguation rules, and according to what we've talked about in class, it's actually parsed a different way. It's going to be wrong, right? Because you didn't write the correct expression. Yeah. So if you uh, write an expression that's invalid under lambda calculus, what exactly is that called? Just invalid, or is it a type of error? Uh, it would be a syntax error, just like any other programming language, right? So we have our specific grammar, and if you don't write it according to the grammar, it's going to be a syntax error. Just something that doesn't belong in the language of lambda calculus expressions. Yeah. Why do we do it left associative instead of right associative? Do you want me to make up a reason? Uh, convention, I would say. Um, actually, let me think. It's probably, well, you can probably, I mean, you just need a way to do it. Uh, it's actually, so that gets into more of the semantics. It's function application, and it's a little bit, I think, would be clearer, more natural this way, the way we think about functions. Um, but honestly, I mean, it's just a, a convention, right? You could do it completely with right associative, and it would Assuming it would be used in homeworks or tests, would you want this to do left associative? Yes, gotta use these rules, right? So this is what we're going with. So in this way, if we write a lambda expression that is not fully, uh, has all the parentheses that it needs, we can, right, we can know exactly what we mean. So this way, there is no ambiguous lambda expression, right? And we're all assuming these rules. Okay, syntax questions. All right, cool. Now let's go to the cool part. So what do what do these lambda expressions actually mean? Right. This is kind of the interesting part. I could I know, we could talk about syntax all day, but really that just means how does it look like, right? So semantics is about what does it mean, right, to be a lambda expression. Okay. So every ID that we see is a variable. That's what we're going to think of it as. Every instance of an ID is a variable. And here we're kind of defining some terms that we're going to use that are going to help us when we talk about what do these things mean. So we say, okay, any variable we see, we're, we're, or any ID that we see, we're going to call it a variable. Okay. When we see this rule, so lambda ID dot E dot expression, we're going to call this an abstraction. And a lot of this is from historical context, too. So we're kind of learning this kind of in the original manner that it was presented. OK. Here, the ID that's here next to the lambda is the variable of the abstraction. Or it's also called the meta variable, but I don't think we'll use this. So this is the variable of this abstraction. So it's some abstraction over this expression E that has the variable ID. Uh, and E is called the body of the abstraction. So another way to think about this is functions. So here I'm defining a function that takes in some parameter, some variable ID, and it has some body, which is the expression. Right? Like we said, lambda calculus, the basic primitives are defining an anonymous function and applying a function. So the ID is the parameter? Yes. No, there's actually no names. So the, um, all functions are anonymous. So like this function here has no name. It is a function that takes in a parameter called ID, and it has some body, which is the expression. OK. Then now here is where, OK, so we have defining functions. Here we have applying functions. So this, what we're using is, so E space E, we're going to call it an application. Right, which is exactly what we call applying functions Right, when we talk about function semantics. So this is going to be how we apply functions. Okay, 
questions on this? Just a little terminology. Okay. So as we said, lambda id dot e defines a new anonymous function, basically. And so this is why. So anonymous functions. Um, so in Java eight. Anonymous functions are called lambda expressions. It directly comes from lambda calculus. Also, in Python, when you define a, what they call a lambda function, right, an anonymous function with no name, you use the keyword lambda, and it actually comes directly from lambda calculus. OK. And id is what we're going to think of as the formal parameter of the function, right? So this is the parameter of the function, and the body is the body of the function. And the idea is function application, right, we're going to think of it similarly to calling function E1 and setting its formal parameter to be E2. Right, so kind of this would be in our classic, more classical, um, let's see, can I write this anywhere? Yeah. In more of our classical, uh, the way we think about it is function name, parentheses, parameter, right? That's how we invoke a function. Here we invoke a function with the function that we actually want to call, right? We don't have names. We can't really refer to them as names. But the function that we want to call space the parameter that we want to pass it. So okay. one is the function and two is the parameter? Yes. Definitely very similar to how, just without the parentheses, right? We already have parentheses. And, Maybe you do Ruby programming. Some people, like one. Um, yeah, you can actually, in Ruby, the parentheses when calling <coughs> functions are optional. So you can call a function without using parentheses, and it actually looks exactly like this. In some cases, it can be a little bit more clean looking, but in other cases, it can be really confusing. OK. OK, so this is. Just simply an example. Okay, so we're going to get an example. We want to build up some intuition for what lambda calculus does, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to first assume that we actually have a function plus defined. Okay, we have not defined a function plus. There is no function plus in base <coughs> lambda calculus. And we have some constant one. Okay, so we also, there are no... We didn't talk about numbers. We didn't talk about addition, numerals. What did we talk about? What did we define? What does our language basically have? The three, the three rules. What were some things that our language has? Variables. Variables. Abstractions. Abstractions <laughs> and applications. Yeah, exactly, right? Variables, function definitions, and of calling functions. There are no numbers in there, there's no operators, there's no nothing, right? This is incredibly simple language. But to understand how this function application works, let's first for a moment just assume that we have a plus operator and assume that we have a constant one. So if we had a plus operator, how many parameters would that take in? Two. Two, take in two, return one, right? Well, kind of. All right, let's see. Okay, so if we want to define a function, a lambda expression that is an anonymous function that takes in one parameter and returns one plus that parameter, what would that look like? Lambda parameter dot one plus parameter. One plus parameter? One plus the ID. One plus the ID? Uh, cool. All right. So we have, what are we saying? Lambda. You want to repeat it? Lambda ID. You want to give it an ID? You want to call it actually ID? X. Okay, lambda X. Dot and then one plus X. One plus X. Okay, cool. What do you think? Probably be one SpaceX if it's defined as the plus. One SpaceX? Yes. Like this? Okay. Yeah. We'll say that's a space. Okay. Oh, you mean like if there's a one plus operator? Yeah. Yeah. 
let's say we have there are two different concepts. Yeah. Let's say we have a plus operator and a one constant. Okay. So I'm gonna leave it. Leave it. What does everybody else think? You could flip the x and the plus. You could flip it. Or the one and the plus. The one and the plus. Well, what? So what makes more more sense? Let's think about this from what we just learned. It should be that way. Yeah, it should be that way. It should be this way. Why? Because the parameters come after. Because the parameters come after, yeah, right? We saw that uh, we define basically function application. So A, where are my parentheses going to go on this expression? Um, around 1 and then. Around? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so first around here, right, and then around here. And the same with here. So if I'm thinking function application, so what does this mean here? Yeah, or like apply, yeah, exactly. So, or which is the function and which is the parameter here? One is the function. One is the function and plus is the parameter. Does that make sense? So does this make a little bit more sense? But actually, did I just lie? How many parameters did I said that one, that the plus operator took in? Two. Two. But can we actually write <laughs> a function that in lambda calculus that takes in two parameters? You can put parentheses around it. Put parentheses around what? Uh, the one in the pl or the one in the x. Ooh. No. So maybe like this. Yes. Hmm. Uh, it's actually a good idea. Well, but what would this mean? That they're one. one. That, that it will be applied parameter one to function x. Yeah, applying one as a function with x as the parameter. Right. So this is actually a good way. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll kind of actually leave that hanging right now about how do you deal with multiple parameters. It actually turns out that you can translate any function that takes in n number of parameters to a function that takes in one parameter and return the function that takes in n minus one parameters. Um, so that's how we kind of get away with that right now. So does everybody kind of agree lambda x dot plus one x will define a function that takes in one parameter and returns one plus that parameter? Yes. Yeah? Cool. So for any given any given set uh, of like x, y, you're applying parameter x to function y? Like this? Yeah. It just With a space there? Here you're, a, you're x is a function. <coughs> And y is going to be the parameter. We're going to actually step through and see exactly what this means, how we actually do function application. Right, but this is what we mean. It's, if we're thinking about a programming language, it would be similar to doing this, right? which is kind of why it makes sense to be here. Actually, maybe that does go to the left associate. So just like this, this is the function, this is the parameter. Exactly the same idea. All right. Right, so this represents an anonymous function, right? This function has no name. It's some function that adds one to its argument, right? And we actually flipped our x. It doesn't, does it matter? So let's think about some things that matter. Does it matter that x was here and one was here? No, assuming we have a plus operator that takes in two and return one, right? The order that you add things in don't matter. What about the fact, why did we call this x? Because x was the input. Oh, the parameter. But why did we call this x? We wrote this function. ID. But why x? Because that's what we've been trained to use as a variable. <laughs> So let's think about it a different way. If you change that x to be something else, could you? Is it the same thing? Could we define a function that adds 1 to its parameter? Yep. Yeah. yeah, so we change both x to w's, it would be the same. Yeah. We change both x's to foo's, they'd be the same. Right? Cool. So let's look at applications. So what happens if we, so is this a, is this function application? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, if you were trying to apply what to what? So let's think about this. Are these parentheses here necessary? 
What if I didn't have these parentheses? Then it would extend all the way to the right, and it would be plus x1, 2. Yeah, so the body of this, this abstraction would be plus x1, 2. Okay. So intuitively, what, what would this mean? What, what, what happens here? 2 plus 1, so you would get 3. But how do you know 2 plus 1? Like, what are you actually doing to so get there? So you apply the 2 to the function on the left and replace but the x's with the 2. Yes, you're replacing the x's with the 2's, right? That's your way to oh, think about things, right? So we do, so here we have our lambda x plus 1x. And so if we want to apply this function to 2, right? I'm going to replace every x in the body of this abstraction with 2, right? And so by applying this, so this is called a reduction in lambda calculus terms. So I'm basically applying this function. So you can think about I'm reducing this. Right? I have two th expressions here. When it returns, it's just going to be the body with x substituted with 2. So I'm going to get plus 1, 2. Right. Was that plus 1 dot 2? No. Oh. Was the, only the body in here, right? So plus 1, 2. I substitute the 2 in here. It's just the body. And we're going to go into exactly what these things mean. So these are, I'm trying to, you want to develop some intuition for what do these things actually mean so that, that way when you look at something, you can compare how you actually mechanically do it versus how it actually looks um, or how you think it should be. And so, yeah, so then we would then reduce plus 2, 1 to 3, right? We didn't do that, but by just a call, um, applying this function, reducing this function, we'll get plus 2, 1. And then if we reduce that, then hopefully we would get eventually 3. Um, okay. So now how can we define a plus function if extract, abstractions only accept one parameter? How can we do this? So we have a language right, that only supports one parameter. Man, that really sucks. That's really limiting. How many functions do you write that take in only one parameter? Rough percentage wise of all functions you write, how many functions just take in one parameter? Not enough to be memorable. To be memorable. <laughs> okay, wow. All right. all right, let's think about this. Yeah, it's probably, I don't know, I'd say maybe 5% would be good, like lower bound. I mean, it really depends, right? So, okay. But the idea is, let's think about this. So, let's say we want to create a function that sums up. I don't know, let's do three. Let's go with three, um, three parameters, right? So ideally, if I was writing a function, right, I would do some kind of uh, fun foo, and I had what, A, B, and C, and I would say this is equal to A plus B plus C, right? I'm defining a function, it takes in three parameters. I'm actually even using a plus function that takes in two parameters. So the question is, so I made the claim at the beginning of this section that lambda calculus, right, can, is Turing complete and can represent all types of computations. Well, if lambda calculus, the basic basis of the computation is functions, well then how could you write what would be a trivial function in normal language in lambda calculus? So here's the idea. Right? Now let's think for a second, right, we were talking about functions. The fact that I called these A, B, and C, does that matter at all? No. No. Right? Okay. So let's make a new function. We'll do lambda a dot lambda b dot lambda c. And we will do plus a b. Oh, I think I need to make more room here. Plus a b plus. So how many fun, how many abstractions do I have in this expression? Three. Three. Right? So all right, we're gonna do something else. I said you can't name things. I'm gonna give this a name. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna use 
we use mathematical naming. So I'm going to say that this thing is foo. Right? So anywhere I write foo, I can just expand it out to this expression. Right? It's not really a, I'm not defining it. I can't call foo within foo. Right? The language has no name for it, but I can just replace it here. So if I call in our language up here, if I call foo one, two, and three, right? You would know exactly what to do if I had to call this function. Right? Actually, here I think we do get into the left associate, so here it makes more sense. Okay. So if I'm looking at this, from my disambiguation rules, what happens first? Or what where do the innermost parentheses? Plus eight. Sorry, in here. Right, because here I'm just defining a function, right? There's actually no, well, you would define say, a function. You would group foo in one, then that in two, and then that in three. Cool. Okay, so let's look at this. So if I call this foo with one, right? So I have foo one, and I know foo is lambda a dot lambda b dot lambda c dot plus plus a b. C, right? All of this applied to with one. So now what do I do? How do I apply this to one? Substitute all the A's with one. All the A's with one inside where? All of the parentheses. In uh yeah, actually, yeah. All the parentheses. Uh, the body of the outermost abstraction, right? Because I'm calling, see, so think about it like this. So if you think about function definitions, here I've defined a function that takes in A. And what does this actually return when I reduce this and apply this? A plus B plus C? Well, lambda B. Lambda does. body, right? Yeah, so it returns a function that takes in one parameter B, which returns a function that takes in a parameter C. right? But we've replaced in here A with 1. right? So let's reduce this by one step. Right? So here we have lambda b dot lambda c dot plus plus, now what do I put in here for a? 1. 1. b, c. Yes? Do you not have to put plus and a in a parentheses? You do, but I'm ignoring that for now. We're assuming we have a magical plus operator that will do it like this. But we can see, I don't know, if we can show this concept, it should be pretty clear about how plus would work. And I actually don't need to put parentheses there because that's not ambiguous, right? So if I do plus a b, we know exactly that plus a happens first, and then that uh, b is applied to that result. So I reduce this, right? So this is this expression here. Oof, this is super ugly. That's this expression here, right? And now I apply what? Two? You apply the result of the top. To two? To two. Yeah? So what do I do then here? Replace B with two. Replace B with two inside this body here? Yep. So I'm going to have lambda C dot plus, let's go plus one, two, C. Shouldn't you see my parentheses sometimes look like C's? Okay, that didn't really help. Right? So let's think about this. First, so here I had a function, right? I want to write a function that took in three parameters and returned some result. So instead I wrote a function, I wrote sneeze. <coughs> okay, so I took uh, instead I wrote a function that takes in one parameter, that returns a function that takes in one parameter, that returns a function that takes in one parameter, right? But that was three, and then that actually does something. I'm confused. Is there an extra set of parentheses in the last one? <laughs> yes. Well, I think it's gonna be another one when I throw parentheses yeah, around. Yeah. 
What's they get? Now can I, do I know what this result is? Can I reduce this result? Plus one, two? Yeah. Right, so we can say lambda c dot plus, say this returns three, c. Right, and then I want to apply this whole thing to what? Three. Three. Right, and then I reduce this, what do I get? Three plus three. Yeah, plus three, three. And I reduce this, give me six. So essentially, this is how we do multiple parameters. Can I see yes. that last part again? Yes. Uh, how does the last thing get applied? This one? Yes. Uh, we need to define a magic three. Actually, so we, we will define a plus operator. We will also define actually the numbers are going to be functions instead of actual numbers when we think about them. Uh, but they will still work and act like we would want numbers to work. Yeah. Can we do it next time with letters? Can you with letters? Like, uh, no, that will make it more confusing. Um, the problem is with something like this, we need some kind of, we, need some, we want it to compute something. So we're actually going to show how we can do this. We're going to define true and false in terms of functions. And we're going to find numerals also in terms of functions. So this is kind of assuming that we've done that and kind of not worrying about those, those steps. Like if I gave you a lambda calculus with a plus operator and with numbers, you could do this. The key part here is in, so this is essentially called, um, not essentially, this is called currying. So technique to translate the evaluation of a function that takes in multiple arguments Right, into a sequence of functions that each take a single argument. So this hopefully shows that you can actually, so actually it's kind of interesting to think about, right? So the ability to take in multiple parameters to a function doesn't give you any more expressive power than just taking one parameter in a function. Right, so you can translate it, exactly. You can translate it backwards and forwards, right? So, uh, okay, so yeah, here we can define a plus operator uh, kind of like this, and we can apply it, and this is kind of the same example, so I'm not going to step through this. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about variables, we've learned a little bit about function application, we're trying to build up some intuition for what function application means. Now we need to talk about the different types of variables, because we wanted to find so right, we're trying to build up a formalism here. So we need to define very precisely what are the semantics of all these operators that we just kind of walked through. Like when we said, oh, replace A with whatever, right? Replace A with whatever's on the right. Well, what does that actually mean? And how can we actually do that in a way that's uh, formal and also safe? Okay. So free variables. Um, so we talked about variables, right? This is any ID. So a free variable is. Think about it like this. I think I'm just going to go. No, you can't see that. Right? So in my lambda expression, so let's think about it like this. If I have an expression x, y, and z, and I have an expression, let's say lambda x, let's say lambda x dot x. So here, what does this x define? What does this x, we kind of already saw that in function application, right? What does this x mean? That's the parameter? Yeah, this is the parameter, right? This is the parameter of this abstraction. It's the meta variable of this abstraction, right? But what does this x mean? <coughs> Which? Right, this x, and this y and this z. Yeah, we don't know, right? They could be anything. We can kind of think of them, in this case, you can think about looking at them here, they're essentially global variables, right? We don't know what they mean. They can refer to kind of, well, anything, right? We don't have actually enough context to understand what they really mean. So we're gonna find these, um, we, we'll call these, these are gonna be called free variables, right? And don't, and so, the idea is, right, so you think about it, so in this expression, lambda x dot x, right, is x a free variable? No. It's bound to that 
right, is bound to this, exactly this meta variable. But if we looked just at this expression, like in a lambda expression of this is x, is x a free variable here? Yes. Yes. So if we looked at like lambda y <coughs> dot, let's see, lambda x dot x y x, right? So is this x a free variable? No. No, it's bound here. Is this y a free variable? No. No, no because it's bound to this abstraction here. Is this x a free variable? Yes. No. No. I think it's bound to that other thing. Is it? No. no. It's not bound to What's the body of this abstraction? x, y. x, y. Yeah, right, from the disambiguation rules. Exactly. This x is outside, right? It's free. So even though it appears, x appears in the same expression, right? This x is a free x, free variable. When we actually resolve free variables like that. We will see. We actually will leave them as is, essentially. Quick question. Yeah. Yes. Um, on that last one, since you had the big parentheses and the dot, everything. Sorry, say that again? Here. So you have the dot x, you have lambda y at the beginning dot. Mm -hmm. Okay, now that whole chunk after that is bound to lambda is, y. It's inside the body of this abstraction, yes. So then this that is the x is that bound to lambda y, right? This x. The last x, the big x on the end. Ah, no, no, it's not bound, right? It's inside the body, but they have different names, right? This is y and this is x. Like this y here is bound to this y because they have the same name. Uh, okay. Maybe like this y references the parameter y, whereas this x. So if that last thing was a, not x. Mm -mm. Yeah, it would also be free. It's a free okay. a. Um, anything like an, a, a in here, a w in here, right? Anything that does not have an enclosing abstraction that has the same name. What if you turn that y into an a? Is, there, is it still bound now? No. No, because it does not have the same name. Okay, so it's, it's bound by name. Then. Yes, yes. All right, I get it now. Okay, so, so we have to define things formally, right? So we'll say x, so any variable x, right? It doesn't matter that it's actually x. It's free in an expression if, right? So what were our four cases? What do expressions look like? IDs. IDs. Lambda dot I, or lambda ID dot expression. Yeah, an abstraction, right? So lambda ID dot expression. Application. Application. Parentheses. Parentheses, right? So just like those are our four base cases, in here we have to do the same thing. We have to define precisely what we mean a free variable is in all of those base cases. So x is free in E if. And ex the expression is equal to e, or x, sorry. The expression is x, right? So x is an id. This means that x is free, right? Just as we saw, we looked at that. x by itself is free. OK, we have one case where the expression is lambda y dot body, right, e1, where <laughs> y is not equal to x, right? So y and x are different. And x is free in e1. Right, so this is, what kind of a definition is this? How do you know if x is free in E1? Yeah, you apply these rules, right? So it's a recursive definition, right? And in function applications, uh, we'll say for the left, so E is going to be free where if x is free in E1, Uh, that is not complete. I'm confused. Um, why is that missing? Where x is free in E2. Maybe it goes to the next slide. Uh, these are examples on the next slide. Oh. Um, okay, it's so in function application. Why would x be not free there? Okay, let's think about what case is not handled here. This is actually really easy. I don't know why it's, it's I mean, 
the rules are kind of simple. So what case is not handled here? And rule number two here. Um, no, let's go on this specific thing here. If y does equal x. Yeah, if y does equal x, right? And why? I mean, not why, the variable, but why? Why does that, why is that case not in here? I think it should be as just free in E2. So if I'm wrong, I will fix that. I've just put a note to go check. It should be recursive. It should be fine. Right? So it's free on the left, then it's free. Or if it's free on the right, then it's free. Right? That's what this should be. It doesn't have to be free in both. Right? E1 and E2. Right? This is saying that it has to be free in either E1 or it has to be free in E2. Right? That means x is free in that whole expression. See, this is, so yeah, so basically we're defining the one case where x is not free is if the expression is lambda x dot e1, right? Right, because then we know that x is not free there. Okay, let's look at some examples. So is x free in x lambda x dot x? Yes. Why? Because it's free on the left. On right, because it's free on the left. Right. So this would be. I'm. I'm not understanding this. I don't know why. Um. So the first thing you have to do is how to parse this. Right. So let's. Right, x lambda x dot x. Right, first question is how do we parse this? X space lambda x dot x. Yeah, x, so if we were to draw a parse tree, right, it would be application. So we'd have x, and then we'd have uh, lambda x dot, and then we'd have the body, which is just x, right? So this would be application. So yeah, this is a space, right? So x lambda x dot x. So we can think of it like this, right? So think of it like this, right? Our rule says, OK, well, x will be free in this expression if it's free in either the left or the right. So first, is x free in the right? No. No. No, right? Because that rule stops us from going in because it says, hey, uh, lambda x, well, x is the same as that name that I'm looking for. So I'd say it's not, in, it's not free in here. But I also have to check the left expression, right? Is it free in here? Yes. yes. Yes, right, because this x is not bound. Exactly. Okay, so this that, is free. If lambda x dot x and that x was an a, then that a was free. If this was an a? Yeah, it would yep. be free. Yeah, exactly. They're both free. All right. All right, let's go to lambda. Free in here. So is this x free? No. Is this x free? Yes. 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 Okay, good. What about the y? It, it's it's free. free. Also free. Yeah, exactly. Because it doesn't match lambda x dot x. Right. Okay. Is x free in here? No, right? Because this is under this body, right? So you can think of this abstraction kind of protects, right? This x refers to this x. The y is still right. Right, the y is free, exactly. Cool. Oh, I get it now. <coughs> the function. Yeah, it's up, yes. We want to ask the question. And that's the body that you just. Yes, it's the body. So we're saying, does the body, are there any, like, what variables don't refer to the parameters. Yes. What are essentially global variables? You can declare a new variable in the body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. 
Okay, so we're going to look at a couple things. So we're going to look at combinators. So these are ways of thinking about different types of functions. So a, an expression is a combinator if it does not have any three variables. So you can think of these as kind of self-contained functions, right? We can look at them, we can use them, and they're not going to change based on context. Like a function with a free variable could change depending on whatever that free variable is, right? So is lambda x dot lambda y dot x y x a combinator? Why not? is free, this y is free, but in this lambda x dot x y x, so this x is bound, right? But the question we really want to ask is what, ex what abstraction binds this variable, right? So, so which, so essentially we also are asking which x is this bound to? To lambda x. Yeah, this lambda x. What if I did something like this? That second, that last lambda x is bound to that second lambda x. So, wait, wait, let's think about this. That guy is bound to the one next to it. This one? It's bound to where? To the one next to it. This one? Yeah. And what about this? It's bound to the other one. It's bound to the other one? But this is a parameter. Name. How can a parameter name be bound to another? Because it's being called as a function, so its parameter is the previous parameter. So it's Think of it like functions, right? So you're defining a function. Here we're defining a function, right, that has some parameter x. Right? Then inside there we're defining a new function, which takes in a parameter into x. So actually we're kind of doing like this. Return a function that takes in that and returns x. Right? In normal programming, what does x do to this x? It what? It copies it. Copies it. Right. 
but it shadows this y, right? You can't actually even refer in the body of y. It actually goes back to scoping rules, right? This is essentially we're trying to find the scoping rules of lambda calculus. So keeping that in mind, right? So does this x refer to this outer x? No. No, does it refer to the inner x? Yes. Yeah. Does it even really make sense to talk about what if this is bound or not bound or free? I mean, this is the parameter name, right? So it's just a new name. Right? It's neither free nor bound. It's a meta variable. That's, I think, why we use the term meta variable, right? It's, it's not a variable we care about whether it's free or bound. It's actually does the binding, right? So we want to know. So when we talk about bind, bound variables, we want to know that this x is bound to this lambda x and not the outer lambda x. Cool. Yeah? Um, if, you add, if you added parentheses on here, right, to fully disambiguate it, what does that look like? Uh, What's the body of this lambda x, this outer abstraction? Everything after the dot. Everything after the dot, right? So oh, just like, oh, okay, I got yeah, uh, just like you have a function body, right? Everything that's defined within <laughs> there that references that same name is a parameter, finds that parameter. Any other questions on this? Yeah.